All right, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 9 tonight. Uh, we went right from chapter 3 to chapter 9. Going to be in verses 8 through 17, um, talking about the, the covenant with Noah. Um, Genesis 9, 8 through 17. It says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you now. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant and I am making between me and you and every living creature with you a covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. And whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to join together, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our conversation, our study, and that you would grow us in our ability to understand our relationship with you and our, our relationship with each other, and in that understanding, you would help us to relate in healthier ways and see from just a little different perspective how relationships work in this world that's gone wrong. Help us, Lord, to learn how to redeem our relationships and how to reconcile um, life back toward you. Help us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have spent about five weeks now trying to get a better understanding of life as God intended it. Um, this idea that people are created in the image of God, working together in harmony as equals, uh, attempting to advance God's cause um, of order from chaos out into all of creation. And we, we talked about last week that human sin disrupted that lifestyle. It introduced negative emotions, it introduced um, competition, domination, um, pain, a lack of fulfillment in work. And now we're going to have to try and start answering the question, how can it be made right? Last week was what went wrong. Now the rest of the, the, rest of the series is how can this be made right? What are some of the things that we can do to set all of this wrongness right in our own little sphere of influence in the environment we live in? Now, the most fundamental way that, uh, to make things right is to understand and implement the idea of a covenant. Um, covenants are God's redemptive tools for relational restoration, and that's really an important thing for us to understand. Uh, we're we're going to talk a little bit about co covenant versus contract in a minute, but, but we just don't have a great comprehension of what a covenant really is, and that's one of the most difficult things that we face when we come to the scriptures. And there's like, like in this particular passage, eight times God uses the term covenant when he talks to Noah, and we're thinking contract, 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 because we live in the West and we live on contracts, and it's not at all a contract, and we have to kind of get an idea of what a covenant is so that we can see how our relationships are either contractual or covenantal. And we want to make sure that especially our home life, our family life, and our close relationships are covenantal relationships. We have to do contracts because of the environment we live in, but a covenant relationship is really critical for family existence. So this covenant becomes the foremost vehicle for restoration, redemption, reconciliation of our relationships. So what is it? What other forms of relationships are, do we operate under? What are um, some of the ways that we function as human beings in a relationship? And how can functioning in a covenant relationship improve the overall quality of our family relationships and our friendships? So we're going to dig in and gain just a little bit better understanding of what a covenant is uh, and how it can help us flourish in our relationships. That's really the goal tonight. So I want to start out with the difference between um, covenant and contract. Covenant and contract. We are familiar with the idea of contracts because we live in an environment full of contracts. What, what are some of the contracts that we deal with on a regular basis? What are some of the contracts we sign on a regular basis? I think of an insurance agent. So yeah. our insurance applications for all. Yeah, absolutely. Insurance applications are contracts. Okay. What else do we do? Anybody use a credit card? 
Every time you sign for uh, a credit card uh, um, transaction, you are signing a contract, making sure that you pay back the bank with some sort of interest for the purchase of the Snickers bar, you know, whatever, whatever you're buying with your credit card at the time. Um, and, and there's obviously a ton of other kind, kinds of contracts. There's employment contracts, there's union contracts, which are a form of employment contracts. Mortgages, if we take out a mortgage on a house, um, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna go down to the bank and we're gonna sign paperwork. Um, everything that we do has this idea, service contracts. Uh, I bought a camera recently and they're like, do you want the service contract? You know, which obligates them to provide me a certain amount of service over a certain period of time for a specific amount of money. So there's, there's contracts. But too often, what's happening is we are confusing the idea of contract with covenant. And it's, it's understandable because we live in an environment that is constantly feeding us contracts every time we turn around. Um, and, and when we do that, when we confuse contract and covenant, what ends up happening is we, we begin to relate to others in ways that are not redemptive and that really don't hold much potential for the vision of human well-being or flourishing or having great relationships. Um, our marriages and families, our covenant relationships, our relationship, typically our friendships will be considered um, covenant relationships. They are not contracts. Family is not a contract. Um, it's, it's a completely different beast. And so understanding this really helps us reshape the way we live as married people and as families and as friends. So the question is, what's the difference? <clears throat> what is the difference between a contract and a covenant? I think I included this in the worksheet. There's a little uh, <clears throat> deal there. Did, did I have fill in the blanks on that? I'm looking, or is it just purely on there? Good, it's all, all the info is on there. Ray. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. So, so when we're looking at this, <clears throat> this is more of a business way of doing things. This, this is a love ex expression, and I, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but this tends to be based on transactions. Um, the fancy psychological term for it is transactional relationships. Um, <clears throat> if, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you which is a way of making a contract, a verbal or implied contract. And over here, it's not about transactions, it's not about business, it's about love and service and those kind of things. And so when we look at this, um, we, we have to kind of give this contrast. You know, the contract um, in, the, in the note sheet, the contract is regulated by the state, typically. Um, it's based upon mistrust, and I think that's probably the biggest issue that we're dealing with here is the issue of mistrust. Contracts are a means of self-protection. We, we, you know, why does the bank have you sign a contract when you take out a mortgage? Because they're assuming that you're not going to make your house payment. And that way they're protected from your failure to make the house payment so they can get the property back and sell it and recoup some of the cost when you, you know, so it's, it's all about mistrust. You know, they come in, they smile and it's all this wonderful stuff, right? But really it's, I don't trust you to make the payment. So, so contractual relationships are this kind of thing versus what's over there. Um, it's, it's written to create limited liability. We just talked about that. The bank gives you a mortgage and they make you sign paperwork. Why? So that they have a limited liability in this experience. Um, there's an opt-out clause in the contract, right? Um, especially, you think of sports stars. Um, when somebody signs a $20 million a year uh, football or baseball contract, they have an opt-out clause at a certain date, or the team has a clause where they can pick up the remainder of the contract or just let you go for a certain amount of cash. Um, that's how contracts work. It's to protect the other party, right? It's all about protection. And then you have, it, it demands joy through mutual benefit. Um, it demands joy. So, so this one is, it, it demands it, it requires it. On the other side of this equation, <clears throat> you have something that is sacred. It's a moral agreement that is overseen by God. So this is not, over here we have the state and over here we have God as the central figure in the, con in the covenant. It's based upon trust versus mistrust. It's almost polar opposites, right? I mean, it's, it's one of those kind of deals. Um, it's, it's accepted to embrace unlimited, and I like this, responsibility. 
So over here, we're on distrust and we're looking to limit our liability. Over here, we're trying to say, let's expand our responsibility for each other rather than this idea of narrowing our liability. Here, and, and I like the way that the person who put this together said it's intended to be permanent, right? Um, sometimes we overstate the permanence of covenant relationships. Ideally, they are permanent. They're intended to be permanent. They don't always end up being permanent, as we know, right? Um, and it seeks joy. It doesn't demand it, but it does what? It seeks it. Seeks joy through mutual sacrifice. And this is, this is really critical. It's a sacrifice rather than um, <clears throat> this demand for mutual benefit. Does, does, this, does this provide mutual benefit? Well, absolutely it does. But this one demands it and commands it and provides all kinds of options to get out of it when one person doesn't benefit the other person the way they're supposed to. So this kind of gives a, a really nice overview of what contract versus covenant looks like. Now we tend to live in this realm of thinking because everything we do, I mean, we, we do it without thinking. I, I went and got gas today and what did I do? I put my credit card in, in, the, you know, in the gas pump, pulled the, that out and there was an automatic agreement between me and the bank, the, the, the loan company, my, my in, institution that said I will pay for the, however, however many gallons of gas that I just put on the card. And if I don't, what are they gonna do? You know, they have legal recourse to opt out and cancel my card. They have legal recourse to seek in court to retrieve the money that I may or may not pay. And over here, you have this covenant thing that is a completely different idea. But we live here and it's so obvious, it's so normal for us, we do it without even thinking. Like today, just take that card out of, the, out of your wallet, put it in that thing and away you go, you get gas but there's this whole contractual thing that is just embedded in our thinking and often comes out in the way we relate to each other. And there are some vital differences to note. At its heart, a contract is a means of self-protection. Now, I know I mentioned that earlier, but it's really important because that gives us the idea of what this is all about. So a contract is about self-protection. Self-protection. Um, we sign contracts to protect ourselves from potential mistreatment by the other signing party. One of the things that gets really muddled in this is that when we do weddings, we sign what? A marriage license. So it, it mentally, it automatically goes to contract, contract. And so what I try to do in every wedding ceremony is talk about covenants because it's a completely different thing. Even though we sign paperwork, what? It's still over here in this realm. <clears throat> Marriage isn't about self-protection. Um, it's about self-giving, really. It's about self-sacrifice, and it works best when both parties get that. Um, contracts, if it's about self-protection, what are you doing? You're anticipating failure, bad behavior, and, and a termination of the relationship. That's a pretty bad set of assumptions. So if I think that marriage is a contract, I'm immediately anticipating failure. I'm, I'm, I'm accepting that there is going to be bad behavior and I'm looking for the termination opt-out. And that really is a poor way to look at marriage. What's my opt-out? Well, you know, when do I get out of this thing? Um, a covenant, on the other hand, is not a contract. A covenant is based on promises. And so, and that, that is the operative word with covenants. And that is the idea of the promise. And there are promises that are intended to bring out the best in the other person. And um, it's to do that through mutual sacrifice. So we make promises and we do that so that the other person is benefited. We're not doing it to protect ourselves. We're doing it so that this new family arrangement, this new marriage arrangement is what? Is moving in the same direction. And we'll talk about teamwork a little bit later, but it, it's, it's, it's the basis of teamwork. We're making promises together. A covenant assumes that both parties trust each other. It should be trust. That, that's why when we base marriages purely on um, looks, affection, feelings, we don't have the full package. Those things are all good stuff, but if we don't have trust, we're missing the foundational element of what this relationship is about. Covenant assumes both parties trust each other, they, they're responsible and they're gonna take up responsibilities and serve each other, that they're intending on helping each other succeed in the relationship. 
There's no pre-planned termination in here. There's not like an opt-out clause. I mean, I, I take that back. In American culture, you can develop a, a marriage document that has that, right? It's called a prenup. We're trying to protect ourselves. And we understand why, because we don't live in an ideal society. We live in this what went wrong society. But the covenant relationship tries to do what? Tries to redeem that damaged, broken institution and put it back into some sort of, some order out of the chaos that we've made out of it. So think, think for a moment about the most prevalent covenant we have, right? The marriage covenant. What are the vows? What are the things that we say to each other typically in a marriage ceremony? For better, for worse, absolutely, right? For better, for worse, in sickness and in health. <laughs> richer or for more. Wait, no, richer or for poorer, yes, thank you. <laughs> Forsaking all others, right? I mean, so, so we have this kind of series of things that we typically do. Um, and there are promises that we make to each other and obviously to God because he's the one that's kind of the, the key figure in the center of this whole thing, Right? Um, <clears throat> have you ever heard of wedding vows that protect the bride and groom from each other? I'm sure some exist somewhere, but you go online and you look at potential vows. It's not this kind of crazy opt-out clause stuff. It's not, I'm going to protect myself from you stuff because marriage isn't a contract. It's a covenant. Do the vows ever include an opt-out clause? Of course not. They just don't. We usually include all of these phrases, until death alone shall part us, right? The permanence clause, the trust clause, forsaking all others, sickness and health, poverty, wealth, all of those things. So the differences between these two things are really, really important. They're huge because it soaks into how we treat the people in the household. If I'm treating them contractually, I talk to them differently, I think about them differently, and I act differently toward them than if I think about them in this covenant realm. Um, so we need to just take a moment and consider how contractual relationships work, this side of it, because most of our day-to-day -day relationships are lived out here, even our marriages and families, uh, because this, this immersion in contractual thinking affects the way we act toward those that are closest to us. So contractual relationships. So when we think of marriages and families contractually, we are conceding that we don't trust the people we live with, and we assume that they will eventually, the whole thing is eventually going to fail. That's what contractual says. There's an opt-out clause and I'm protecting myself from the failure of the other person. Um, it's not really a healthy assumption, obviously, but being surrounded by contractual relationships makes it almost impossible for us not to think that way. We have to make deliberate effort to think on the other arena, right? We have to think differently about that. But not only that, you get about three or four inter interpersonal failures or conflicts into a marriage it makes it easier to relate in contractual ways, right? Because all of a sudden, now I feel threatened by that person's behavior, their words, their, their attitudes, their actions. And now all of a sudden, what am I doing? I'm putting up defenses, right? I'm trying to protect myself. Because it's almost the natural thing to do in a fallen, sinful world is, well, I've been offended, I'm gonna push you out here, and I'm gonna try and protect myself from you. Pro Proverbs 18, 19, um, one of my favorite verses, actually, from the Proverbs, a variety of different translations, but I, I think I took this from the NIV. A brother wronged is more unyielding than a fortified city, and disputes are like bar the barred gates of a citadel. So what happens relationally is you get two or three of these really, you know, these really good distrusting things that happen or a few conflicts under your belt, and you, are, you get yourself in a defensive stance. In, in relationships. So there's this defensive posture that we go after that really isn't part of covenant thinking. It's purely a contractual thing. How do I protect myself from this behavior in the future? Right? And so you begin to steal yourself. Even if you don't do it deliberately, mentally, you are doing it behind the scenes. Um, so when, when we're wronged, we start building defensive walls against the people who are wronging us, and they become barriers to the healthy, joyous relationship that we are hoping for. Right? Um, so over my years of marriage counseling, one of the primary roots of marital strife is relating to each other on this side of the equation, on the contractual side of the equation. We're protecting ourselves. The contract is this defensive posture. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's actually three things in the contractual side. So it's, it's defensive. We've talked about that. Um, it is also an attempt to dominate. This, in the domination idea, goes back to Genesis 3.16, where God talks to, probably about part C, 
where God talks to Eve uh, in the curse narrative, and he says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And so, you know, we, we, people tend to love the first part of that. Your desire will be for your husband it feels so romantic. And, you know, it's not romantic words in the Hebrew at all. It's actually, um, you two will be sparring constantly in relationship for who is in charge, is the essence of that. And, and we know that to be the case. So when we're, when we're living contractually, we are living in a defensive posture, but we're also at times offensive. In other words, we're trying to, to make sure that we're in charge. It's, it's kind of the who wears the pants moment, right? I think is how the common cliche that we use in our culture. So that's what it does. And then, then the, um, the other side of this is transactional. And we talked just a minute about, ago about that um, transactional. So instead of the love that, that was mentioned earlier at the top, it's about giving and getting. So if you give this, I'll give that. And if I get this, I'll give this. And so it's all about this exchange of time. And it's, it's not unusual. I, I find this really interesting. Um, it's unfair because this person isn't doing anything and I'm carrying more of the load. Um, if they would do more. So there, there's almost always a transactional narrative in marital strife. Almost always. And it's understandable because we're fallen people and we live on this side of the equation. Right? Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So if we pause for a moment, and, and we begin to think about how much of the relational conflict that we've experienced has happened because of this contractual, defensive, tr dominating, transactional mess, you go, almost all of it is in there somewhere, right? We're, we're sparring for who's in charge, we're, then we're defensive. We, we want to win. Honestly, domination is about I want to win the argument. And I, I can't say that I've ever had a disagreement with my wife that I didn't want to win. Okay, maybe I'm just overly competitive. Horrible, sorry to those folks that are listening online. Um, but that is a horrible confession. But what is it? We want to win. We are just driven for this competitive thing that's going on here. And then it turns transactional and we try and compromise and get to some sort of resolve, sometimes without going through trust and love and God and those kind of things. Because we're over here making a contract, you know, if, okay, if we do these things, we'll be okay. And almost always those things are transactional. Um, so the language of marriage and family often turns from this kindness and affirmation, right, to a defensive competitive expression, and so then hostilities arise and the narrative changes dramatically. Flip side of that, there is a way to live redemptively, okay? There is a way to live redemptively. <clears throat> Obviously, we are not going to do it perfectly, though we can do it, you know, we can do it to some mode of sufficiency so that we're not constantly living under the, the, the um, idea of competition, domination, transaction, defense. Uh, and, and that is a covenant relationship. If we're going to move from contract to covenant relationship, um, we need to go back just for a second. The core founding principles of the covenant, relationship with God, trust of each other, responsibility, permanence, sacrifice. I mean, th th that's pretty good basis for a solid loving relationship. When relational conflict, because we talked about conflict on the other side of this, when relational conflicts erupt, erupt covenant-minded people view the conflict as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship rather than to win. So th this, this is covenant, is I want to strengthen it. You get over here in the contract and it's just about winning. It's about gaining um, a place. It's about gaining advantage over the other person. And so the covenant, covenant minded people view the conflict as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship, not to win the argument. And that is a huge, huge difference. If I'm all about winning the argument, I've forgotten about why I'm in the relationship to begin with, which is the betterment of the other person serving together towards God, God's purposes and his mission, um, trying to help each other navigate the sinful world we live in. And if, if um, I'm living contractually, it's about defending myself. The covenant relationship, though, in conflict, it's no longer about how do I defend myself in my position from this person. It's about how can we work together. So um, this is a teamwork concept versus... Um, defend myself and win the argument, right? So it, it, there's a huge difference between the mind frames of these types of relationship. 
When I'm on the covenant side of this thing, it's okay, now we've had hostility. We do want to come to resolve. How do we come to resolve? Well, we have to work together, and it's about strengthening the relationship, not winning the argument, not gaining the upper hand in the relationship so that I can be the dominant personality in the experience and win every time. We're not trying to position ourselves to win. Okay, I say that, and I just need to give a, a momentary caution. Please understand this. We are not talking about the kind of conflict that is abusive, okay? Um, abuse is so far outside the realm of a healthy relationship that it has to be met with self-protection and defensive action, okay? Covenant principles do not require people to subject themselves to abuse. And I say that because sometimes I, I, I'm on the receiving end of counseling situations that have come from other churches even that say, well, my pastor told me that I have to go back into this abusive relationship because I have a covenant. And I'm saying, no way. The covenant does not require you to subject yourself to the abuse by another person. So when we're talking conflict here, we're not talking edging up on abuse. We are talking about the normal conflicts that we have on a day-to-day -day basis that we struggle with because we're sinful human beings. Covenant thinking looks at conflict and it understands it as a normal part of relational experience, okay? We understand the covenant is given, given to us because humanity is in this horrible, what went wrong phase of life. And it's God saying, okay, here's what we're going to do to help you set your relationships right and get some sort of the, the ideal and the intent of Genesis 1 and 2 into your experience. But instead of allowing a defensive posture over here to take over, we don't want this to take over as it so often does because we're not trained in this idea. We now look for ways to resolve the conflict, to strengthen the family, to serve each other. So this, this is a serving mindset. It's, it is a mutual benefit mindset, but it's not forced. It's not demanded. It's desired. Sometimes it means that we have to walk away from the conflict. Okay? Most, most times when I hear this stuff, the conflict is heated, and when it gets emotional, there's only one thing that we can do. That's build defenses and attack the other person. So it becomes combative. So we have to, what, step away, calm down, come back at it when we can do it this way rather than that way. Um, this contract is all about me. Me is the center person, right? Over here... We are the central focus, okay? Me versus we. Contract is all me, 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 me. And covenant is we. And, and by the way, that's at least three people, okay? It is God and the two parties that are in the family together. It's at least that many people. But it's always about we. How can we strengthen? How can we move forward? How can we resolve this together together? Um, Again, sometimes we have to walk away and come back until it's controlled, schedule a time to talk and chat and all that stuff. Um, intense arguments are always an environment for contractual thinking. Um, step away, regroup, come back, self-sacrifice, trust. We as the focus rather than me as the focus. That, that has to function that way. Teamwork is critical. Covenants thrive on teamwork. Right? This, is, this is why a lot of the Old Testament covenants failed with the children of Israel because they didn't like doing things together. They got competitive. They got contractual. They started focusing on their tiny little group within the, in the group. If, if you read the book of Numbers, I did a lengthy study on leadership in the book of Numbers uh, about six months ago. Every time Moses ran into a time of critical disruption in the children of Israel, it's because one group out of millions of people, one group of a few 10, 50, 100 decided that they wanted to have it their way. And they wanted to assert dominance over Moses. They wanted to assert dominance over the nation or over other groups. They were not into the teamwork concept. And they paid the price for that, obviously, when you read Numbers. There's about seven cycles of that from chapter 11 through the end of the, end of the book. But teamwork, covenants thrive on teamwork. And the basis of teamwork is trust, sacrifice, and respect. Trust, sacrifice, and respect. If we're working to better the other people and we're focused on the we of the marriage or the family, the friendship, um, if we want to strengthen those relationships, conflict resolution becomes opportunity-centered. Okay? Over here in the contract world, we are focused on problems. Over here, we are focused on opportunities. 
And it, I know it sounds almost cliche, but the reality is when we start looking at conflict as a covenant experience, we're going, here's an opportunity for us to become better, to become better individuals, to become better as a group of people, as a family. Um, it becomes about we instead of me. How, how can we work together? How can we develop the best resolution for our marriage and family? Instead of defending myself from everybody else's onslaughts and, and being hostile toward each other, now we have to open ourselves up to their thoughts because they have valid thoughts that are an important part of what we, we are doing. Listen, if, if we look at, at the hardships through problems and we come to resolves that are compromises, I'm not a big fan of compromise because it's not really resolved. Somebody in the compromise is paying the price for the compromise. They just are. That's contractual. Over here, we're trying to produce the best solution by listening to everyone. And that's hard to do. Um, anybody that's ever worked on a committee of any kind understands that people don't always share their, their opinions because they don't feel comfortable sharing them. That's, that's not teamwork, that's contractual thinking. And we compromise. Well, I'll just get the best, we need to hear everybody's opinion. Let's sit down and chat. Let's talk about this. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna make this major financial move and buy a house. What does everybody think? What are the pros? What are the cons? I, I remember when we were in transition here between associate pastor and lead pastor, um, we, had, we had three or four different pathways that were right in front of us. I had a missionary friend called me. He said, man, I could use you in Spain. Would you come to Spain for two years? I live in the south of Spain. I think that would be pretty cool, right? And so we put that on our sheet. We, we said, I said, well, go back to seminary. Put that on the sheet. We could stay here and be the youth pastor and our new lead pastor. We could maybe be the lead pastor here. We could go somewhere else. We had our little chart out there, and we started praying, and, and we started giving our ideas as a married couple as to what would be the best outcome for us. And then we obviously had to include God and say, God, what do you really want? Um, Spain seemed like it was almost far enough away at the time because it was pretty turbulent at, at the moment. And eventually it was, no, you're supposed to stay here. Okay? But we couldn't have come to that conclusion if, we weren't, if, if I had dominated the conversation or if my wife had dominated the conversation, we wouldn't have come to the right conclusion if we were, if we were trying to win our side of it. We had to work as a team. And maybe we disagreed. Okay, well, let's work out the disagreement. Let's wrestle this thing out and come out with the best solution for the family. And that's all a part of that becoming one flesh concept that's in Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 2. Um, it's about us growing together and becoming more of a team rather than individuals who are trying to protect ourselves from the other person. It requires discipline it, because it's so easy to think defensively. Well, their idea is attacking my idea. Eh, no, they're just putting their idea out there. It's okay to have other ideas. Um, it, it's easy to ignore a person's insight and their, their wisdom in favor of our own and, and get defensive about it. So when we look at the times that God establishes covenants, they are always redemptive in nature. Okay, and this Noah covenant is really, really important to that, right? Because here it is, human wickedness from the fall all the way through the flood has just increased and increased and increased. And then God says, I've had enough. I'm done with this. I'm going to start over. We're going to hit the reboot button. And he hits the reboot, and then immediately he says, here's a covenant. And basically reestablishes the relationship that he had with humanity and nature, I love that, and nature in this new covenant. It's not just a humanity-only thing all of earth, all of the earth, all the living creatures, you and, you know, and everything else. And so there's this reestablishment of God's intent for humanity and creation. Um, and you move out to Genesis 15 where we get the next um, note of covenant relationship. God makes a covenant with Abraham and he promises that he will bless all nations through Abraham's descendants. What is it? Well, that's a redemptive thing because he's pointing out to Jesus. Though Abraham didn't understand that at the time, we do now. It's like, look at that. It's redemptive. Every one of those things is a redemptive covenant with his people. So when we think of how to set things straight, how to, how to make them right, we have to think in terms of covenant relationships. It, I mean, it's what God does to set stuff right. And, and as we look at our own relationships, you know, it, it's sometimes hard to focus on the covenant principles because we're not used to them. Um, so a couple of questions, and I don't think I included this in the note sheet. Um, am I relating in ways that see God as a central figure of my marriage, family, or friendship? Friendships, right? Are, are they in there? Okay. No, you didn't. Okay, I'm repeat. Am I relating in ways that see God as a central figure in my marriage, and family, and friendships, my relationships? Second... Is a relationship based on is the is the relationship based on mutual trust? Is there trust in the relationship? Is the relationship based on trust? 
Are we seeking joy through mutual responsibility and sacrifice? Are we seeking joy through mutual responsibility and sacrifice? Do I approach my marriage and family defensively? Am I always on the defense with them? If I am, then there's something, there's something obviously wrong with the relationship that needs to be shifted. Am I approaching the relationship defensively? Are we handling conflict as an opportunity for growth and strength? Because conflicts inevitably happen when human, you put two human beings in a room and they're eventually going to disagree. It just depends on how that disagreement is utilized, um, whether it's contractual or covenantal. Um, or are we allowing the conflict to build up defense mechanisms and protective mechanisms? Because that's not what God wants us to do with that. When, when we're at odds with each other, he wants us to work through a process that brings out the best possible solutions, not defensive mechanisms or compromises. There, there should be solutions and resolutions that strengthen the relationship, not diminish one party or the other or take something from both parties. Um, so, so, I mean, there's several, I mean, hundreds of other questions we could ask, but those are just some that kind of get up underneath the, the hood of this. And we can certainly talk more about this, but it's, it, this is, this is life-altering when we begin to look at this because so often we relate to each other in our closest relationships in contractual ways. Um, we can even tell when our tone of voice is contractual with another person, when we're demeaning, when we're demanding, when we're you know, dominating um, in, in a situation, then we've stepped over into the contractual world rather than maintaining our covenantal, okay, let's hear what you have to say. And we need to make sure that we're in this world because this is where um, the, the best, most joyous, healthiest relationships are, is on this side of it. Sadly, we know that these are never going to be perfect, but we can, we can have better relationships if we think through this covenantally. So we are going to maybe look a little bit more at this next week and, and push through this concept further out so that we, we continue to answer the question, you know, how do we redeem it? How, what can we do to set it straight even though it's been messed up?